Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're gonna talk about self-watering pots. I have compiled a few of the most common questions that I get about this system, these pots, how orchids are doing in these types of pots, and I will be answering them today, just so I can actually link you to this video whenever new viewers will have concerns and questions and issues with the self-watering setups. So with that said, let us actually start with the beginning and explain what a self-watering pot is. Now, just as the name suggests, the self-watering pot is a type of pot or setup that waters itself. Sadly, it's not gonna go to the sink, get water, water itself, and you're gonna have a great life. We're not there yet with technology, but who knows? What it means is it actually has a reservoir of water from which it extracts the water and keeps the contents of the pot wetter for longer. The setup consists of an interior pot which has a wider lip that can sit on top of a mask pot. This is how I call it. Inside, the pot has drainage and through the drainage, I run a wick and the mask does not have any drainage. It is used as decoration, of course, to hide whatever I have inside and also as the reservoir holder. Hence, no aeration holes or drainage holes. I do have a video in which I show you how I make these pots. Well, I don't manufacture them, how I choose them to work together. I won't insist on it, just check the video down below. And pretty much this is my setup. You can find for sale other types of self-watering pots which use slotted cones to go inside the reservoir. I choose the wick because it's easier for me to DIY it. There are a few ways in which you can achieve a self-watering pot. Speaking about this though, I will show you a few of my preferred types of pots because I did have quite a few questions regarding this. I have full access to the pot inside. I can dump out the water, I can add water, I can clean the mask if I so desire. The pot that actually contains the orchid is pretty much completely separate from the mask. The mask has the same role as a dish, but a bigger dish that looks great and actually covers the pot inside. This is my preferred type of setup with orchids. I'll show you a few more variations of this. Here is a transparent pot that sits on top of an opaque mask, but as you can see again, I have full access to the actual orchid pot. And here I have something pre-made, purchased this way. It is a self-watering pot that has a gauge, which again gives me full access to the actual orchid pot and full access to the reservoir. I can dump the water in the reservoir, I can add things, I can wash it, I can do whatever I want. So for those of you who are asking kind of what type of self-watering pots are best for orchids, I would go for something that gives you access to the reservoir because orchids are just so different and it's always good to have absolute control over what you're doing. I'll show you what type of self-watering pots I absolutely do not recommend for orchids. Here we are, you might actually have seen something similar on the market. This is a self-watering pot which does not consist of an interior pot and a mask, it actually has a type of grill on the bottom and this is what makes the reservoir. The problem with this type of pot, even though it's perfectly fine and I do use these pots outside with my garden plants, when it comes to orchids I have absolutely no control over the reservoir, over the plant inside even. I cannot control the level of moisture necessarily all that well. If I so desire to empty the reservoir, I cannot. There is no way I can tilt it to dump the water out. It's not even like a uh, semi-hydroponics type of pot. This I do not recommend. It might work if you know exactly that this is what you need, absolutely, but in most cases it will be a trial and error, at least at the beginning and you need to have full control. I personally don't recommend, I don't prefer, unless you absolutely know what you're doing and you know that you do not need to control the reservoir. If such is the case, I'm not gonna be the one to tell you what to do, but if you're a beginner or you just wanna try out the system, don't go for something like this. Choose something with more control. Next very common question I get is what type of medium can we use with a self-watering pot? Well, there is a bit to debate here, but I'll just sum it up in whatever medium is suited for orchids and is absorbent, it has capillary properties, it can work with self-watering pots. You can use ceramics, 
Leka, as you can see. Being that the self-watering pot was first created for house plants, obviously you can use soil. Soil is very wicking. This is for terrestrial orchids. And as you saw in my previous example, even sphagnum moss because it is very wicking. One thing that I would like to mention here is the difference between inorganic and organic setups. Leka, ceramics, uh, rock wool, other materials you might want to use, they're inorganic, they will not be subjected to biological decomposition. So you don't really need to worry about that aspect no matter how wet the pot will be. With organic setups, the breaking down will be accelerated. It will be faster than if you wouldn't use a self-watering pot. So you need to think if you are okay with disturbing the orchid once a year. Maybe the type of medium compensates or makes the disturbance of roots minimal. You have to consider this as well. Sphagnum moss, in my opinion, disturbs the roots very little if you know how to remove it. It is also the type of medium which degrades the fastest. So even if I keep it in self-watering and I can hold on to it for a year, it's still okay with me because I should have changed it anyway. But with organic setups, I believe it's good to invest in good quality products because I will just give you an example. The sphagnum moss you just saw can last me, I believe, a year or maybe even more, I will have to see in self-watering pots. And I had the experience with my Paphio petalums. I used to use a very, very poor quality bark, which degraded in less than six months, maybe three months or so. It started to accumulate molds and smell bad and degrade. That was a poor quality material. Even though in self-watering pots, we don't really use bark because it's not a wicking material. You can use it as a top layer or even spread throughout sphagnum moss or other types of water retentive media. In self-watering pots, bad quality bark and other organic materials will decompose faster. So if you wanna try it out, if you wanna use it, go for something that is higher quality. It is absolutely not normal for bark to degrade faster than sphagnum moss. So just keep that in mind when you choose the medium. And as I was saying, make sure that the medium is wicking. Now about the wicking aspect, roots or actually development on orchid roots is wicking as well. If it reaches the bottom, it reaches the wick, it will draw water from there. So if that happens, you can even put rocks around the roots and it will still kind of work due to the roots being able to just wick the water. Is it ideal though? In my opinion, it is not. Because in many cases, and this maybe depends on environment, the top layers are just so, so, so dry. So you will only have the tips of the roots actually being wet and absorbing water, which in my opinion is not efficient, especially from the point of view of nutrient absorption. In my own personal opinion, the bigger the surface that the root has with water and fertilizer, the better it will absorb, the faster it will absorb, especially if you think about Phalaenopsis or other big orchids. That's besides the point, but it's one of the reasons why I don't really want to recommend media that is not wicking. Although you will have the impression that some orchids will work just because they touch the wick with their roots, it's not ideal in my opinion, so I cannot recommend stuff like bark, rocks, or anything that is not uh, water absorbent and wicking. Another very common question is what orchid will work with a self-watering pot? Will a dendrobium work, a noncidium, a cattleya? And my answer will have to be any orchid can actually work because stop thinking about the reservoir as the reservoir and a very, very crucial component of the setup. No, the reservoir is there only if you need it. If you don't need it, you can just not keep water in the reservoir. And we will actually talk a little bit more about this point later. So. That's why I was telling you that I would recommend self-watering pots which give you control over the reservoir, not the one that I showed you, because at some point you will say, hmm, you know what, I don't need that much water at the reservoir, but I do want to flush the orchid. I want to dump out the water, maybe leave only a little bit of water, maybe not leave any water, maybe leave a lot of water. You need access to that reservoir and this type of self-watering pot is perfect. And as I was saying, any orchid can work in a self-watering pot, even cat layout orchids, which are known to like to dry out. I am not caring for my cattleyas in that way anymore. Ever since I switched to semi-hydro and in organic media, I find that this is really not the case. My cattleyas, particularly in the summer, they stay wet all of the time because if they don't, they dehydrate. I keep them outside, it's hot, it's windy, they transpire a lot of water, they need to be wet all of the time. Hence the self-watering pots that really help me out. Um, so even cattleyas can work in the right environment, in the right setup. It all starts from thinking about the 
reservoir as a dish under the orchid. You have the option to leave water in the dish without having the orchid sit in water or dump out the water from the dish. It is really up to you and what your orchid needs. And related to the question what orchids we can grow in this setup, the most asked question and addressed concern even is that this system is not appropriate for orchids which need a winter rest or dormancy or just a pause from watering and fertilizing. Um, well, again, if you think about the mask as a dish, there is really no difference between a regular pot and this. Simply don't water the orchid, don't leave water in the reservoir. And this is what I'm doing with some of my dendrobiums. If you need to sprinkle a little bit of water, sprinkle a little bit of water, let it completely drain and then just dump it out. It's really as easy as that. And you can use the setup as a self-watering during the growing months, during the summer, when these types of orchids do actually need a lot of water. And come winter or lower temperatures, you can absolutely control the water this pot will get. So, the reservoir is not a crucial and uncontrollable part of the setup. It is actually very controllable and you can actually forget it is a reservoir and consider it to be just a decorative pot. If you don't need to water the orchid, just don't water the orchid. It really is as simple as that. You can absolutely give winter rest to orchids in the setup as well. You can drain the pots very, very, very well in the setup as well. And you can also forget that this is a reservoir and just enjoy it as a decorative pot. Having control over the reservoir lets you actually adjust the level of moisture you have in your pot. Even if we're not dealing with a dormancy orchid or a rest type of orchid, let's say cattleyas, if you have a cooler winter that actually affects your growing space, you can actually control the level of moisture in the pot simply by not letting water sit in the reservoir and just simply dumping it out. Another question is related to fertilizer. How do we fertilize in these setups? Well, pretty much the same as we would in any other type of setup. I do, however, believe it is better to use the weekly, weekly type of fertilizing scheme. So for example, you know those types of fertilizers which tell you fertilize this amount once a month. Well, get that amount and split it in four, let's say. Let's presume you fertilize four times in a month, split that quantity in four and that's what you should fertilize at a watering. Depends how fast your reservoir dries out as well. I personally always go for fertilizing less, at least until I figure out how the orchid behaves, if it is a hungry orchid or not such a heavy feeder until the orchid establishes itself and so on and so forth. I always kind of under fertilize, if you wanna call it that way. And then when the orchid takes hold of its environment and of its medium, I can actually go to my preferred dosage. About the preferred dosage, oh, there's such a discussion about it. What I would tell you is whatever fertilizer you are using, never go over the amount that they recommend. Go under, start with scheduling the amount they recommend uh, throughout the month or throughout two weeks, depending how the instructions tell you to fertilize. All you need to keep in mind is that that fertilizer will be available pretty much all of the time or as long as the reservoir is full of water. Therefore, you will not be so prone to salt buildups. And being that the fertilizer will always be available, I would just go with a smaller quantity, at least until I figure out if the orchid is a heavy feeder or not. And that's how I fertilize. I use the MSU fertilizer. As you might know, I just don't go with what they recommend, at least not for everybody. There are heavier feeders and lower feeders. I'm not gonna use the full amount on a Mastavalia or something that has sensitive roots. I will absolutely not do that. I might use the full amount on the Ingracums, the Vandas, and possibly the Catleas, but you know, that type of fertilizer gives you actual instructions for weekly, weekly, as they call it. But bottom line, whatever fertilizer you might have, start with lower quantities, half the amount, a quarter of the amount, try to spread it uh, throughout the month because that fertilizer will actually be available constantly to the orchid. Unless the reservoir is completely dry, it will always be there. So no point in actually providing very, very, very high amounts of fertilizer all of the time. And this applies to any setup which tends to be rather moist than um, something that dries up. With drying up, the fertilizer becomes unobtainable for the orchid. So you will have fertilizing pauses in a typical setup, but with wetter setups, you will not have these pauses. You will have constant fertilization. And I do believe it's better to not 
overdo it with the ratio of fertilizer in the reservoir. Another very common question is where do I actually get these pots? Well, flower shops, garden centers, these are the ones that I did myself and you learn more about them in the video that I share with you in the description. But if you really wanna go to something more professional, maybe more appealing looking, obviously try the Lechuza systems. I find them very good, but very expensive. Uh, there are other options on the market as well. If you have them readily available, why not? It really is up to you. But if you just wanna try it out, if you're not sure if you actually like it, or need it in any way, you can absolutely DIY it. And I think the cheapest version is with the microwavable containers. Yes, this, I purchased them at the grocery shop and the mask actually comes from Ikea. It's their cheapest ceramic pots, decorative pots. They just make a perfect fit at the top and that's what I want. As a wick, I just bought myself a mop, a microfiber mop, and I'm just using strands from there for quite a lot of time now. You can also DIY it from the actual orchid pots you might already have. So if you have something like this, obviously you can find a container that will make a perfect fit or a perfect seal at the top. You can use something like this as well. So even if it's not very, very practical, at least it will give you an idea if this will work out great for you, if, if it will help you at all, if it will work with your kid. So rather than spending money on something more fancy or professional, you can definitely start with something like this, just be creative. And a last question, is this suited for everybody and in every environment will this help everybody I don't believe so it's just like any other setup everything can work but for the right person with the right availability with the right conditions or in this case with the right need if you live in a climate which is rather cool even in the summertime and you don't really have issues with watering too often and so on I don't think this will help you in any way or will make any difference in some climates and environments it might actually be detrimental because the reservoir having water all of the time it will take the ambiental temperature and if the ambiental temperature is already low maybe having a constant supply of cold water is not what your orchid needs I mean most definitely it's not if it's a warmer grower um, of course you can keep the setup dry but if in summer you would need to keep it dry as well what's the point of actually having it you can absolutely go for a normal pot also because it was created to cater to people that don't really have the availability to water don't really have a constant and abundant source of good water for orchids such as myself obviously this will be more useful for those types of growers. If you don't find yourself in need to conserve water or in need to water way too often or just having a bad time with your orchid, this might really not be for you and there's no point in actually investing in it. Not all orchids will behave the same for everybody. Um, this has to do with the medium as well. Bottom line, if you really, really don't see any reason why this will be helpful to you, then chances are it will not be helpful to you. So, you know, if you wanna try it, try it. If not, don't invest money in lechuzas or things of the sorts. If you never need high moisture, you don't need self-watering. Um, and I think from here on, it's really up to you to decide. And I think that is about it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed this and I hope I've answered most of your questions. In the end, as I always say, when you wanna try out something, try it with one or two orchids, see how it goes, see if something is for you or is not for you, if it actually helps you or not. And from there, you can better decide how to use it in your environment or if you wanna use it at all. So with that said, thank you again for watching. You know the drill, like or dislike this video below, subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos, tutorials, Q&As and other fun orchids subjects and if you like YouTube to notify you whenever I upload a new video just turn on notifications for my channel also if you're interested in the other things that I use in my setup such as light types of medium and so on just expand the description I list everything there and with that said I'll see you guys next time bye